Okay, let's get started. So just a quick reminder as folks join, if you could please mute yourself. I think I have the settings right, but uh, one never knows. So we're waiting for Lynn to log in, but I wanted to introduce this this month's topic, and it was really fun because it came from a podcast listener, and usually podcast listeners are writing in with questions about problems they're having or issues they're having, and this was the opposite. This person, she's delightful, she wanted to know, why are horses so cooperative? And I thought this was a fabulous question to ask because at the end of the day, sometimes it still shocks me that horses are so willing to let us just monkey around on their backs. You know, these prey animals that they allow us to just climb aboard and do the best we can. But a lot of times, you know, give, any given day, we're probably not doing that great. And they're just so cooperative, especially if we, when we work with young horses, it always illuminates for me the generous spirit of these animals. So I thought this would be a fun one to talk about with Lynn. And it looks like you're on, Lynn. Is your audio working? I think so. Am I yeah. clear there? Yeah, you sound good. So I was okay. just telling the listeners where this topic came from, from a podcast listener. And it's fun to have something to talk about that's not like, how do I fix this problem? It was... <laughs> Wow, why are horses so cooperative? And as you're going to help us understand, this is in their innate nature. And and I think we're going to talk about maybe some of the pros and cons of that, or, or what do we do to be responsible stewards, knowing that they are so cooperative. But I want to hand it over to you so you can help us understand a, a little bit more about their nature. Why are they so cooperative? And, and how do we how do we interpret that? Well, I think we need to make a distinction between horses who are cooperative by choice, the horse who takes initiative, um, who looks out for you, forgives your mistakes. Um, that's the partner I think we all really want. Yeah. And then there's the horses who are just tolerant because they don't see that they have any choices. And that's that's a different topic, uh, a sad one, but a different topic. Uh, the, the cooperative horses, I think, are a fun topic because there's just such a, a rich um, array of experiences that, that goes with that. And as you said, it does come naturally to them uh, because horses in the wild don't live in uh, dominance hierarchies, as we've often been told. A horse band is a family unit and um, everybody looks out for every, uh, everybody else and they survive on cooperation not on competition. Um, and so they have actually in a band like this whole network of social interactions. And it starts with a foal has a long, long childhood, really. He's not weaned normally until at least eight months, which is pretty long for a mammal. And so he's got that long bond with his mom. And then they don't leave the natal band usually for at least two years. So we have more bonds forming. So long-term bonds are really important to horses. And then in a band, the leadership is shared, shared or distributed, depending on which researcher uh, is naming it. Okay. Um, but nobody has the authority to tell somebody else they have to follow them. Following is, is completely voluntary. I mean, it sounds like chaos, you know, compared to, to what people expect. Yeah. But this is, this, is how they, this is how they function. A horse decides she's going to go somewhere like, oh, I'm thirsty. I'm going to head down to the creek for a drink and others can follow her or not. Their okay. choice. So they're accustomed to this um, pretty uh, comfortable, um, you're, you, you do these things by choice, but you generally choose to hang out with your friends and you're more likely to follow the leaders that you trust, the ones who have proved to be reliable, which are probably usually the older and wiser ones. But in general, it makes sense to a horse to follow um, another horse who has proved to uh, provide the resources they need, like the food and water, and makes them feel safe. So with this background, um, any, sort of <coughs> uh, any sort of authoritarian leadership mm -hmm. makes no sense to a horse. It's completely completely alien concept. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, following a leader that you're comfortable with, that you trust, makes perfect sense. 
That's really interesting. I just want to underscore that the, this idea that following an authoritarian type leader, and maybe we wanted to find that a bit more, but is really <laughs> alien to them. I just remember all our lessons when we were little kids being told, now you need to be the boss of that horse. And, and maybe, mm -hmm. maybe that's just the uh, lacking the right words to say what the instructor me meant, you know, but maybe they were saying you need to be more clear, but the words we heard were boss or um, in charge, you know, things like that. But I, I think what you're saying is actually that's contrary to their nature. It really is. And I think you nailed it when you said clear. Most often when I see that somebody's having trouble with their horse, it's not that the horse really is, the horse is not trying to dominate them. The horse usually doesn't mind doing what the person's asked, but they're not clear on what it is. So, you know, how, how can I do what you've asked if I don't understand what it is? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that, that really is the, the bigger issue. The other thing is, this is all about emotions. Um, emotions um, drive behavior. So all behavior has some emotion behind it. And what's the emotion when, when we're with our horses? Do our horses generally associate us with safety and that's positive emotions? Or do they associate us with uh, pressure and anxiety and negative emotions, which by definition are not safety? So when we have a horse who's cooperative by nature, that's generally a horse who's saying, I like you, I trust you, we're, um, we have this social bond. And so uh, it means he's going to go along with what you'd like to do. And the more horses feel the, um, the comfort of the, um, the safety of the social bond with you and, and, who, and her lives are generally spent in more positive emotional states, those horses develop a more optimistic attitude toward life. They become more resilient, they become more tolerant. And so you make a mistake, like, oops, I, I caught you in the mouth over that jump. Mm -hmm. They know it was an accident. They know you didn't mean to hurt them. You didn't set out to upset them. So it's like, yeah, okay, I, I, I got it. We'll, we'll, you'll do better next time. So, so they're, they're going to be more tolerant. Would it be, would it be fair also to use the word, uh, we might say they're more trainable? Like sometimes you'll get a horse that I would refer to it as like, this horse is more trainable compared to other horses. Would that be fair to use that language there too, Lynn, for these kinds of horses that have had a lot of positive feeling like you're describing the result of Oh, that? I think so. I, I think the science is very solid on this point that, um, that when animals are in a positive emotional state, they're able to learn better. And the things that the, the memories that they store are more positive memories and, um, and then make it more likely that they're going to want to continue to learn and continue to work with you. It just really highlights how important their early years are. Like, as I'm listening to you talk, I just get, am more um, worked up about the, the, that initial training of a horse and how important it is when they leave this family band that they have this natural social structure and they have their first interactions with humans. And as I said, I'm always shocked at how, how willing these young babies are to, to try to figure out what it is we're asking them to do. But depending how that goes, uh, listening to you talk, it just really underscores the importance of that period. I think that that early training. Oh, I think it's huge. And in fact, even before we get to training, if we start with, uh, if, we, if we're starting with a domestic foal, um, the later he's weaned, usually the longer he's had with the security and nurturing of his mother to develop the brain circuits that go with um, positive view of life rather than the fight or flight brain circuits that say, I've been, I've been taken away from my mother and, and I don't know what's happening and I'm all alone. And then the fight or flight brain circuits really come on strong and possibly even stereotypies. And then that makes it harder for them to learn. But when we start with that positive, and if they're positive, one of the best ways to get going with a foal is to have a good relationship with his mother because they learn by watching. Mm. So foal sees you interacting with mama in a positive sort of way. Well, you must be a, a fun creature to hang out with. And, and so right away, we're off to a trainable start where, well, people, people mean good things. 
So it, it's about that emotional background that's going on all the time. That's a, yeah, that's an excellent point. And so, well, I, I don't want to interrupt you. Did you have more thoughts and uh, that you want to share with us in terms of their innate hardwiring, if you will, to be so cooperative for us? Um, no, I mean, I think that's, uh, I think that's, that's basically the foundation of it, that uh, if they get off to a good start in life, then they have an optimistic view of the world. And if we come in and most of our interactions with them are positive. Mm. And by that, I don't mean we have to protect them all the time from anything unpleasant. Um, stuff happens. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. But for instance, if we have a horse and something unpleasant happens, it, um, <clears throat> if we're there to support them, you know, okay, the vet's gonna have to stitch up this cut. There's no way we can make this pleasant, but I'm here with you. And, I'm, and I've already shown you um, how to understand what I'm asking you to do. So when I ask you to stand still, you're gonna understand that. And you know I'm here and I'm supporting you. So we can we help them get through things like that. Or um, the first farrier visit. That might be traumatic, especially if a horse now needs, needs shoes. That, of course, that shouldn't be the first visit, but um, you know, when something new happens, if we prepare them for it, then we have shown them how to cope with negative things. And that again, makes us a leader who helps them get out of negative feelings and into a comfort zone again. So they associate us with good things happening in general. That's, that's what makes them so tolerant of the bad things that happen occasionally. Yeah, I know in, in the notes you had sent over, you said it, the word you used that I like so much was resilient. It helps create a resilient horse. And whether that's physical or emotional, and, and there's some interweaving of the two, I think, but, you know, the type of horse that can go in and out of different social settings with other horses and not be right. adversely affected, the type of horse that can handle changes of settings and not have meltdowns. And they're just more resilient. Certainly we've all had the pleasure of knowing, you know, a few of these horses and it's delightful to see that level of, um, you know, just confidence and assuredness and it's such a great goal. Um, I wanted to make one point that you and I have talked about before. And I think this will kind of segue into maybe the downside of horses being cooperative, which is, uh, to, to draw a distinction between compliance and, and, and cooperation in the way that you've just described it. And horses, as most of us know nowadays, are um, innately wired to hide their pain. It helps keep them alive in the wild. They don't want to be have a subtle pain and be limping around and making themselves seem vulnerable to predators. It's, it's in their nature to to be stoic in that sense. Um, certainly some horses are a little bit better about showing us when they're uncomfortable compared to others. But I think in some, in some ways it's a good thing, in some ways it's a bad thing because sometimes we miss what's going on with them physically. Like we miss minor ailments and ouchy spots until they become major things. And then, the, you know, it's not fun to ride them or maybe they're actually misbehaving. They get to that point. But I did want to make I did want to make that point because I certainly see this a lot and I really honor their spirits when I see, and I'm, I'm not uh, separate from this. I've seen a horse packing around a rider that's doing the best he or she can, but you know, the hands are bouncing around and the bit is pulling here and the rider's out of balance and the horse consequently can't find a steady rhythm. To me, that would be severely anxiety inducing if I were an animal that relied on locomotion to get from point A to point B. And I couldn't get myself in a steady rhythm because this person was on my back all over the place. And I've seen them with just serene expressions on their face, just plodding along. And I think, oh my God, bless my heart. But there is yes. a measure of physical discomfort going on. I mean, we know if you carry a backpack on your back and it's all over the place and you're trying to run, you're going to have some sore spots at the end of the day, right? Uh, but, but that is, I think too, what makes them so cooperative and it never ceases to amaze me. Obviously we can get greedy as their trainers and riders and push too much or not recognize these instances. And I think 
then perhaps we turn them into being compliant, uh, which is not the same as cooperative. But but I'd like you to flesh that out a little bit because you're you're good at explaining this. Thank you. Well, I I, I want to emphasize what you said about sometimes you can. I, I've I've often seen writers who just make me wince because they're all over the place, and yet the horse just keeps on. I mean, not just day after day, but year after year, packing them around. Why? And I truly believe it's because the horse knows that person loves them, cares about them, wants to do the right thing. And horses are really good at reading intent. So they're like, yeah, well, she means well, and she's doing the best she can. So I guess I better take care of her. And, you know, as you say, we, we don't really want to subject them to that discomfort, but right. it is just kind of humbling that they're willing to be that um, that forgiving yeah. as 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 we go on, and sometimes they they do things. Be, before we go on to the negative part, I wanted to mention some of the things they do that that people maybe don't always appreciate. In fact, sometimes people actually see it as disobedience. But uh, in addition to ignoring discomfort, uh, horses when they're thinking of themselves, when they're thinking partners, they will do things like anticipating what we're going to ask. Mm. Um, and in a dressage test, it's like, uh, no, we're not supposed to canter until we get to see. <laughs> but if, if you're riding up to a gate and your horse lines you up with your right hand at the gate latch without your having to give a single cue, personally, I think that's wicked cool. Yeah, yeah. Because it means he's thinking ahead and he's trying to make the job easy for me. And then and and I I just love that sort of thing. Yeah. Um they'll cover for our mistakes. I I uh, lost the first place in a command class one time because the fellow I was riding, we got to counter canter. And I asked him for counter canter. I knew he knew how to do it, and he took the curve, he took the inside lead, and we lost the class. He he knew it was a hunter show, and he knew perfectly well that you never, ever, ever canter on the wrong lead in a hunter show. <laughs> so he was doing exactly what he thought he was supposed to do. And I knew that at the time. And I thought, I am happier having second place, knowing this horse was trying so hard to do exactly what I wanted than I, than I would have been with first place. It, it's just, that's, that's the sort of uh, partnership teamwork and thinking ahead that that I really appreciate that's cool that's cool um and and we can get and, and there's also intelligent disobedience there horses who really trust us are willing to say no I'm not cantering in this footing because it's not safe yep. or no I'm not going over this jump because my rider is not balanced enough and a real partner will do that. They'll save us from that. Um, we had uh, we had a uh, an incident in our state forest one time when my husband and I were were riding our horses. Uh, we had uh, we came to a culvert that we had crossed many many times before, and suddenly they were not crossing that culvert no matter what we said. Uh, we got a phone call a week later from a friend who was riding the same trail, she said, don't cross that culvert, there's sinkholes there. Yeah. <laughs> so the horses had seen that, but they weren't afraid to tell us, uh, no, this is a negative. So this is part of the uh, the real cooperation where the horse, the, it requires that the horse trusts us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, so moving on to the horses that, that really don't have, um, where, where the, what looks, what might look like cooperation really is, just they they have found that no matter what they say nobody's listening and the consequences of not being obedient are just too unpleasant to risk it um and some of these horses it's not real obvious they may be just this may be the horse that is just standoffish you know he does he does his job but it's like eh, don't bother petting me um, I'm not interested in hanging out with you. Just let me do my job, put me back in the pasture and go away. Mm -hmm. um, or it might be the horse who is just so anxious. She's terrified of making a mistake. And so she may be so frightened that she's shaking in terror, but she's doing exactly what you tell her to do. And then you get the ones that are just completely checked out. It's like, I don't care what you tell me to do. I'm going to do it. And if you tell me to go um, run through this mud where we might slip and fall up. Oh, we'll just, there we go, slip and fall. 
that's what you told me to do. And those horses get downright dangerous. Yeah. And it's there's really no mystery as to how they got there. We start with domestic horses who are weaned too early, left in panic to cry and cry. Um, people think they get over it. They don't get over it. They give up. And that's where learned helplessness is getting started. And then we put them into training where obedience is all that matters. And so the trainer is watching the feet, not the emotions. Hmm. And I know when, when you're working with a horse, you're watching what the body's doing and what body language is telling you the emotions are, right? Yeah, certainly. I mean, what you're describing, as you're talking, I was thinking like, what is the percentage of horses that I work with that I would say fall into this column that are really obedient? Like they never do anything wrong, quote unquote. It's mm -hmm. a pretty high percentage, but but I, I don't feel like there, there's just something that's not happening, you know? And, and I think that's what you're putting your finger on. It's like, yeah, they're not obedient. They're not showing me that they're in pain. They're not misbehaving, but I also don't think they're thriving. <laughs> and it's, no. it's a big percentage that I encounter anyway. I don't know about you. Oh, I see it all over the place. And, and it's sad. It's, in fact, it's like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then you start seeing them everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're not only shut out from, from relationships, but they're, they're also shutting down their intelligence because their intelligence doesn't really develop if all they're doing is following orders. Mm -hmm. When they trust us and we give them time to think things through and experiment and find out that it's okay to make a mistake and we'll clarify for them, um, their brains are working, they're thinking, they're using the cognitive part of their brain instead of just the conditioned obedience. And sadly, that's what horse training has been for so long is, is in fact, programs are named that conditioned obedience training program. Mm. And it doesn't allow for any develop of the, development of the intelligence. And I think the shutting down of the intelligence goes along with shutting down the emotions. So uh, Susanna just posted a question. Hopefully we will get to that at the end. She asked, so what do you do about this situation? You know, if, if you have a horse like this, what do we do? Uh, we are going to offer some takeaways here, uh, hopefully before Zoom cuts us off, but but continue on your <laughs> So thank you for the question. We do plan to address this. So get, carry on, Lynn. Ah, well, the, the main issue, I think, in, in the thing that you're describing is that uh, is a trainer focusing on just what are the feet doing? That's the other thing. Move their feet, move their feet, prove that you are in charge. Well, that's that's really just dominance and it's intimidating the horse into obedience at some point. You know, put uh, put enough pressure on it until he acquiesces and does what you want. And and that's what shuts down the emotions. So um so and and this puts a horse in, a, in an anxious anxious frame of mind. And so the emotions that are associated with people and with being ridden and with training, all those emotions are negative emotions. Mm -hmm. So that leaves a horse in a more pessimistic point of view. So that's a horse is going to get defensive quicker too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I, I, if I'm if I'm working around um, in the paddock with the horses and I accidentally poke somebody with a pitchfork, they don't take offense to it because they know it's just Lynn being klutzy as usual. And they know that they that I don't mean them any any harm. But if I were always do this, do this, do this, and you didn't do it well enough, do it again. I'll do it fifty more times. They would be in a, a much tenser, more um, uh, defensive state of mind, and quicker to take offense. I think at anything that goes wrong. Yeah, that's interesting because. I, th I think I think you're totally right. And, and also where my mind was going listening to you just now is I think a lot of these horses end up really, we would call them lazy. Um, they're they're not, you know, the, the type of horse you got to thump on them to get them to go. And they're like, they're kind of going through the motions, sort of, <laughs> but not with a lot of enthusiasm, not with a lot of curiosity, as we've covered in previous talks and the importance of of having a curious mind state. All of that's lacking. Uh, 
I think a lot of these horses might end up in that column. And, and then the other thing too, that's worth remembering from the physical standpoint <clears throat> of this training, that's just a little bit more by rote than anything else is there is a dulling of the senses. I mean, physically on their sides now we've proven, and I, in, in the last 20 years that, that the, the fascia and the tissue, just like anything that re receives a lot of friction, it just thickens on their side. So where you used to be able to communicate wow. subtle pressure, now you've got to use bigger pressure and bigger and bigger. And then consequently the horse tunes you out a little bit more and more and more. And you know, that physical and mental state is connected. And you end up with these horses that they're not overtly misbehaving. They're not bucking anybody off. They're not running away. They're kind of just going through the motions. You know, uh, I think a lot of, a lot of horses end up in that camp of a certain age. I mean, you might probably not going to find a three-year-old that's like that yet, but certainly 10 or more years older. I think I see. Well, I think so. Uh, they're, they're really just mentally trying to disengage as much as they can from whatever's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I and ironically, probably the most sensitive a horse ever is is the first day you get on their back. Yeah. And if you if you if you stick with that, then you have the horse who's so sensitive he's reading your mind instead instead of going through a phase of dulling him and then trying to get him more sensitive over again. I had a question, kind of along this line. I had a question that popped through my head <clears throat> as I was thinking about this conversation with you today, and I wanted to or maybe it's more a reflection. I wanted your take on it. I encountered a few years ago, a high level uh, jumping trainer. And I mean, these folks that jump six foot fences, my hat is off because I am a weenie. Yeah, I couldn't take me enough. I couldn't do it. Never. And it, I mean, there's real skill and horsemanship. And, and I really admired this rider. He had just gotten his own horse imported from Europe. It was a young mare. And he was very particular about who handled it and how they handled it. And he was the only one who rode it. And I remember he, you know, he was jumping her once and she got a little frisky and he didn't, he didn't get after her. It didn't, you know, escalate to the point where it was dangerous. He didn't bring her back, you know, under control, so to speak. And I think he saw the quizzical look on my face. And he said to me, this one is my own horse. I'm not training this for a client. And he said something to the effect of, I'm going to leave this one a little ragged around the edges, or I'm, I'm not going to train all the, all of this out of her. I want her to be a little, you know, spicy or spunky or however he described it. But the way I interpreted it was he wasn't going to make her like toe the line hundred percent of the time. Cause he wanted that extra, he wanted her engaged. And, and this mare was a firecracker. So her version of being engaged was a lot of vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> and I think maybe that ties in with what we're talking about. What do you think about that? I do. I think that's perfect. And, and I expect that that was the kind of horse who it on a tough jump course, approaching a tough jump would be the kind of horse who would say to him, yeah, you see it. I got this one and I know we can get over it. And she would like be going the extra mile hmm. and, um, and, and really be that partner who takes over where, where, you know, you might, um, you know, might be struggling with something. Hmm. And, and I, I, not, not nearly as fiery a, a situation, but, but I've done the same thing pretty much with bronze, my, my Arab. I could see from the get-go, he had a personality where he wanted to have an opinion about everything. And I let him, I, fortunately, I, I, I was being coached through his training by somebody who understood this and I let him have his opinions. And this horse, he thinks, he, he practically reads my mind and he gets me out of jams. In our first uh, musical freestyle at a show, I completely forgot what my, what my pattern was. I'm trotting across X going, oh my, where do I turn left or right? So I just sat there and Bronze knew exactly which way we were supposed to go, covered for me. Nobody knew I'd forgotten temporarily except him. So, you know, that's a trade-off. If you want a horse to toe the line and always be obedient, don't, don't expect him to think for himself when you need help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. think we get it both ways. But I wonder, do we want to come back to that question about what do you do if you have a horse who's not at that at that point of um, you know, who, who's not the the uh, thinking, engaged, confident partner? The horse who's either shut down or afraid, you know, what, what can we do? What we can do is look for every way to engage positive emotions 
make their lifestyle as good as possible. You know what, what, the, what the behaviors say, friends, forage, and freedom, the maximum that you can. And then in our interactions with them, evoke positive emotions. If you see anxiety coming up, back off. That's not letting them get away with something. That's saying, I see your anxiety and I'm looking out for you. And if it's something that they need to cope with, then we help them learn to cope with it. You know, so, oh, here's this scary new mounting block in the arena. Okay, I'm not going to force you to go up to it, but I'm going to walk up to it and show you that it's perfectly okay. And when I'm sitting on it, holding out a carrot or whatever, then maybe you just like to come over here and check it out. And then, then we're all good. So we've turned something potentially negative into a positive. So that's, that's um, the best way to, to get those horses engaged. And in the process, smile a lot. Smile a lot, laugh a lot. Horses recognize human facial expressions. So they know a smile is a good thing. They definitely know that laughing is a good thing. My horses have been learning way faster since I started laughing at mistakes. Honestly, the, I ask them to do something, they do the wrong thing, I just laugh. And then I re-explain what I was asking for, or if I know they already knew it, then I, I just, then I, I just say something like, no, really, let's get real. You knew what I was asking for, but I don't get on their case. And, and they use your tone of voice. They, they get it. You know, I think they really get way more nuances of feeling than people give them credit for. So, um, and, and the main um, positive emotions that help horses get engaged are the bond with you, investigative behavior. The, this emotion of seeking or curiosity is huge and it's one of the best ways to bring horses out of being shut down or anxious. Take them for walks and just let them explore the world. And of course, play. Mm -hmm. They might not play if they're too shut down, but you can play and let them watch. Do mm -hmm. silly things, put a cone on your head or something and, and and after a while, they start they start getting the joke and, and they start to realize that, oh, play is actually OK. So if anybody's joining us and they and they aren't familiar with Lynn's book, um, What Horses Really Want, there's more specifics in there. I know we're moving quickly because Zoom cuts us off um, sometimes <laughs> without telling us. And it's telling me now we have eight <laughs> minutes, so we'll see. Um, but so if you want to learn more about investigative behavior, definitely pick up Lynn's book. And then Lynn and I also did one of these video chats on, which is probably on your website as well. I think Lynn on investigative behavior. Yes. specifically. And in addition to what you just offered, which I agree with in terms of how, how do we help maybe lift a horse from a compliance state more towards a, an actively cooperative state is I'm a huge uh, believer, as we've talked about, in helping them find balance, physical balance. I think a lot of these horses are just physically and emotionally shut down because their bodies are in restricted states, just like us. And and uh, the more I, bodies like to be in balance, it brings positive feeling. So the more that we can ride them with a nicely neutral spine and elongating the neck, not raising the neck up like a llama moving in a good rhythm. These sorts of things are really, really important from a mental standpoint as well. And then I also, lastly, Lynn, wanted to ask your perspective. You know, I, it's really, really simple, but I think it's worth considering is that a lot of what you're talking about in terms of creating this willing and happy partner, a lot of this can be accomplished just by spending more time with your horse. And I'm wondering, I don't know if people who will watch this video, many of them probably keep their horse at a boarding facility and maybe only have an hour or so a day with these horses, maybe a couple of times a week only. And to be honest, I think one of the best things you can do is just spend more time with your horse. It doesn't mean more time riding movements, but it might be more time walking around the neighborhood, exploring an obstacle, hanging out in the field with them, just more time like that to develop some of these bonds that I, that you're talking about, but I wonder, Lynn, in your ideal world, how many days a week or time throughout a week is helpful for, for fostering some of what we're talking about? Wow. That's, that's an intriguing question. Um, <clears throat> you know, just to be realistic, we only have the time that we have. And I think what's more important than the amount of time is the quality of time. And 
you know, back to your point about helping horses move in balance. And I know sometimes when we first ask horses to do some of the exercises that you suggest, they may say, oh, this is really hard. But if we just gently persist with it and the horse eventually starts feeling like, oh, I can do this, then we have an accomplishment and we have progress. And now we're associated with, with that positive aspect of it. And also okay. spending time can just be hanging out in the stall with them while he eats hay mm -hmm. or standing in the pasture while they graze, just, just being there with them because that's what horses do with their, with their horse friends. Right. They, they usually engage in any productive activity together. They just hang out together. Yeah. So that makes sense to them. Yeah, very true. Um, let's see, any last closing remarks? I have a feeling we're coming to the end of our time here. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, to, since I don't have anything profound to say, I'll, I'll quote de Pluvenel's uh, famous quote about you can never trust a horse who's trained with fear because there will always be something he fears more than you. But when he trusts you, he will ask you what to do when he's afraid. And this is the horse who's the engaged partner um, who, who will even look to you when he's frightened and sometimes frightened to the point of shaking. But you are the trusted person. And so he's going to look to you. And when you say, yep, I got a plan and I'm looking out for both of us and he'll be right there for you. Yeah, it's such a noble goal. And it's so awesome when you can see that play out. And it's definitely something mm -hmm. for all of us to strive towards. It, it's just the coolest to be, to have that yes. of success with a horse. It's just awesome. <laughs> mm hmm I think that that's what we all want, and I think it's much more achievable than a lot of people realize, but we need to let go of the idea of being dominant and focusing on obedience and focus more on the relationship and what the horse is feeling instead of just what his feet are doing. Well said. Well, thank you, Lynn. And if anybody who tuned in today has suggestions for future topics, you can email either Lynn or I. And if this was a fun talk to listen to, feel free to share it with your um, horsey friends. It'll be posted on Lynn's website as well as on my YouTube channel. So till next time, yes. super fun as always. Yes, indeed. Good to see you. Take care, everybody. Bye.